Um, so I will kick off. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar in the Beef and Lamb New Zealand Central Targo Farming for Profit Silver Lining webinar series. I'm Nicola Chisholm from Ag First, and I'll be facilitating tonight's session. Um, so the aim of these webinars is to deliver some practical tools and tips to help you navigate the current economic environment and also to highlight some future opportunities for the red meat sector. Um, last week we focused on how you can achieve efficiency gains by applying a lean approach to your farming business and we've posted some videos and links on our Facebook page to help you get started on this. Tonight's focus is on managing farming businesses through a high cost environment and our aim is to deliver some more specific ideas around ways in which you can improve profitability and business resilience. Uh, just before we begin, a couple of housekeeping notes. If you've got any questions, um, we really encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar as you think of them. So to do this, if you just hover your mouse on the screen and down the bottom you'll see an icon that says chat. If you click on that, you can type your question into the chat box, which will come up on the right hand side of your screen. And I'll collate those during the webinar and we can put them to Georgia at the end of the session. Also, just a reminder, if you could please uh, make sure you've got your camera and microphone turned off during the session. Right, let's get into it. Um, tonight, we are very fortunate to have uh, local accountant and advisor George Collier joining us. George hails from a background in farm consultancy and is a director at ICL Chartered Accountants in Alexandra. He's got a wealth of experience in assisting farmers uh, to enhance their business profitability um, and has plenty of ideas around reducing costs, protecting income, financial planning and managing banking relationships, which he's going to share with us this evening. Thank you, George. I'll hand over to you. And you're on mute, George, so you might need to unmute yourself. If you just hover your mouse on the screen. There we go. Technology. There you go. Okay, great. Thanks very much, uh, Nicola, for uh, the invitation to talk this evening. Uh, so I've got um, a number of topics that I'll just talk through this evening. Uh, one of them's on our farm server, and that's just to give a little bit of perspective of um, what's happened with our client base over the last 20 odd years. Uh, some ways to um, reduce cost, and one of them, of course, is to increase income. Uh, looking at uh, improving profit long term, reducing costs uh, in the medium to short term, perhaps some ways to find some cash uh, in these sort of tough times, and uh, financial planning in terms of working with the uh, bank, and just some summary notes. So with our farm survey, we've been putting together a farm survey for our sheep and beef farming clients for the last 35 years, and it involves a range of farming types. We've got four different groups of farms, uh, and uh, we um, have a medium result for each farm class and a top 20% result. Uh, what I've got here um, is the weighted average of all of those farm classes. Uh, and I'll just work through um, some key ratios within that information over that 20 year period. So this is back in 2001, uh, 2023. And this is uh, income up here, so 100% income up here, and what that income has gone towards over those last 20 years. So this is, down the bottom here is debt servicing in the blue, uh, and the average debt servicing within our client base over the last 23 years has been 14%. The red here is the farm working expenses to gross farm income, and the average for that is 62%. So this leaves a farm surplus up here of 24% um, on average. And certainly that's the sort of minimum that's required uh, for a sustainable farming business to meet those other costs of drawings, tax, plant replacement, and repaying some debt over time. Uh, our, our guideline would be certainly 25% of gross income. Uh, after debt servicing and farm working expenses. And I guess what we can see over here with our client base is that there's sort of been this role in reduced profitability, particularly through that mid-2000 period uh, where incomes really went down and, of course, interest rates went up a wee bit. And then it rolls back down into much higher profitability, a really good year in 2012, a lot of tax paid, 
and then it rolls again um, and some good years over the last three or four and then it's what I'm really saying is that there's a real rolling effect uh, and and that the the green pieces are much bigger the um, more profitable years are, are much wider than these than these skinny years if I moved on to the balance sheet uh, what's happened with our average sheep and beef farming business over that period is that uh, we've had a, a growing value in terms of the asset. So the assets have gone from this sort of 350 stock unit back in the early 2000s to this sort of $1,400 a stock unit. And uh, that um, over here, I guess, Nicola, you can see the, my mouse moving here. Um, that um, is the growth in the land price, of course, over time. And this includes uh, the value of stock and plant. And, uh, you know, there's some flatter patches. Uh, there's a dip in um, the value of livestock. But generally, of course, the trend is up over time. The debt level's gone from just under $100 to close to $300 a stock unit. Uh, but, of course, the equity over time has grown enormously. Uh, and with the sheep and beef business, of course, we do need high equity uh, because of um, typically the, the lower returns. So if we looked at this in terms of the return that a farming business is getting over time, this is the return on total assets. So this is, uh, this is the return after farm working expenses, after um, depreciation, and after paying a management wage for the owner on the property. Uh, so the return on total assets, the surplus after farm working expenses, depreciation, and that wages of management to the owner. And that's gone up and down, but um, and quite a good year here, 6%, and back towards this um, 1.5%, 2% here. So this has averaged about 2.4% over that 23-year period. Now, that's based on the increased value of that land over time. So it's not based, of course, on the original value. It's based on this increasing value over time. If we looked at this other yellow line, this is the increase in land value over that period. Uh, and again, you know, there's some of these periods where we haven't had much land value increase. And then there's been other years uh, where there's been quite big land value increases. So that's averaged around about 6.1%. Uh, so if we if we moved on to the next slide, uh, that return on investment uh, is around about 8.5%. Of course, it's very hard to bank capital gains, but it is a reality of our farming businesses over the last 25 years. Uh, and it can provide opportunities for, for more leverage in the business, of course. Uh, but in the end, we do need this return. We need this operating business return. Those were those other ratios I've talked about. Um, and the fact that the up cycles are certainly longer than the down cycles. And that uh, things tend to roll. And, uh, you know, from all accounts, things are starting to roll up again. And they certainly need to. So cost is not always cost. And I thought it was just worth analysing our returns for our medium group. Uh, and that's bringing together all those four farm classes and what the top 20% are doing. Uh, but every farm um, is different, of course, and every farm is different. Uh, but the, these are the stats that come out for us. So the, the income per stock unit uh, for this top 20% group are about 20%. Um, I'll just get my notes here. Yeah, they're about 20% uh, higher. Now, what we measure this on, what's the, the measure of uh, what we're using as the denominator? It's the farm surplus per stock unit. So the farm surplus per stock unit is uh, the measure that we're using. This top 20% group have an income 20% higher. Their expenses are the same as the medium group. So it's actually their income that's driving the difference here. The interesting part of all of this, of course, is that their farm surplus per stock unit is 90% higher with a 20% increase in revenue per stock unit. Uh, and on a per hectare basis, it's just over 100%, and part of that's related to the stocking rate. So if we looked at the core ratios for this group. Now, this is 
This is the 23 information. Uh, farm working expenses, gross farm income, 54%, uh, debt servicing, and what we call a magic index. So that's adding farm working expenses and debt servicing together. Uh, the lower that number, the lower the magic index number, uh, the, um, the better the magic. And with our other group, the medium group here, 70%, 16%, and this 86 percent so it's below that 75 percent threshold that i talked about before uh, to really be able to make um, reasonable financial progress this return on investment is, is probably the summary of all of that information uh, close to a four percent return compared to 1.3 um, and it's really income driven so if i pulled out the stats a bit further and drove that down and said, well, what's the top group look like compared to the medium group? Top group has a slightly bigger scale, uh, slightly higher stocking rate. And if you look down here, everything's higher uh, except the wool price, um, lambing percentage, wool weight, lamb price, hogget price, wool price. So it's just the wool price is actually the same more or less, but it's a little bit of everything. Uh, adds up <clears throat> to a lot more product, but significantly a lot more product per stock unit and a lot more product uh, per hectare. So 20% more production per stock and 20% more production per hectare. And then if we looked at the costs, so if we put these $89 uh, and $88 against the uh, production per stock, you know, we come out with these sorts of figures here. So of course the cost of production for the top 20% is actually lower because they've got the same resources going in uh, to uh, their livestock, but they're actually getting more production. So the cost of production is, is lower uh, than, than this group. Uh, so cost is not always cost. Um, sometimes we think we're saving a dollar, but uh, if we work it out per kilogram of sold, uh, product sold, uh, we can actually come up with a little bit of a different answer. So just moving on, uh, every farm is different, lower cost farms per, you know, about put 10 to have higher production, uh, production efficiencies, a lot of those things we've talked about, uh, less feed, some uh, often to produce a kilogram of saleable product. What we're finding with some of our farms, Valley Floor, South and Group tend to have some form of cropping, dairy grazing or beef finishing in the system uh, just to push their income levels up. Uh, in our Hill Country Group, um, those that can uh, have some sort of fine wool in the system uh, have a substantially better income uh, if they can retain a satisfactory lambing percentage and lamb growth rates. And that's often the challenge, is that the finer we go in our wool type, uh, it's, it's the ability to maintain some of these things is quite challenging. Uh, so just a couple of observations there. Improving profits long term. And what we're looking for, I guess, is that farm working expense the ratio to, at 55, that should be 55% to 60%, um, in an average year. Uh, so it's really um, not necessarily in, in that completely low year, which we might have been in the last year or even this year, but, but and it's certainly not in that high year, but it's what, what is that ratio in, in, a, in an average year, 55%? And so the question really becomes, in an average year, is my long-term business model the right model or do I need to change it to have 55% or less farm working expenses? Uh, so what's worth considering with that exercise in terms of looking at the long-term model is modelling the existing farming system, understanding what feed is grown. And the way to do that is to put it through some sort of biological programme that um, can determine the amount of feed that is grown based on the production that's in place at the moment, to understand the relative profitability of each enterprise uh, and to investigate alternative exercises. And I've got some enterprises, I've got some returns over to the right-hand side here. And so these have just been modelled lately uh, within different farming systems uh, of the return per kilogram of dry matter eaten. Uh, so it allows um, the feed modelling programs allow the ability to determine the profitability of different various enterprises uh, within um, by using 
the same amount of pasture and, and um, those sort of things. So uh, feed, sometimes it can be a lot more grown um, and, and there might be quite a good opportunity there. Sometimes it can be a mix of slightly different systems. And then it's putting that whole system together. What is the best fit farm system to optimise profitability and resistance in the long term? Having the right business model is perhaps the biggest thing that um, that a farming business can really focus on because inevitably it makes profit if it's the right sort of system uh, that's suited to that sort of property. Um, so mix of enterprises, high income, uh, fits the feed curve really well, so not harvesting and feeding out lots of feed, and it suits the property and management. Uh, so modelling the existing farming system for long-term profitability. So medium-term opportunities. Uh, and again, a lot of this comes back to uh, this uh, cost of fees and having an absolute focus on maximising that cheapest feed, which, of course, is pasture. Uh, and managing pasture to maintain quality and inevitably, if we can keep pasture in that growing zone, uh, we grow a lot more feed and it's much, much better quality. And of course, the stock do a lot better on it. So pasture management within our sheep and beef systems is, is just a huge opportunity to reduce cost uh, because the cost of pasture is so much less than if we're growing crop. Um, and of course, we can have some amazing crops um, and we can drive down the cost by having a really good yield um, and having good quality and, and feeding it off uh, really well, utilising it. And supplements, you know, our hay silage, baleage uh, has another step stone in terms of cost. Uh, and there are opportunities to have more of this compared to our supplements at uh, the 25 to 35 cents. Uh, then it will help in reducing the cost in our system. So some of the principles, pasture, of course, is the cheapest, and getting the right mix of crop and supplement is really important. And so if we can grow more crop and perhaps have less supplement, uh, then it can have a really positive impact on uh, the cost structure within our business. Pasture persistence is a really big issue, particularly in dry environments, um, and that depends uh, on the management around soil fertility establishment, grazing management. Uh, and sometimes, of course, we just have to have a, a bit of lady luck on our sites in terms of the weather and everything. But a lot is to do with the preparation and planning. So um, there is there is a big difference between a run-out pasture and, and something that's performing really well. Of course, having the right species. And in Central Otago, of course, we have a very limited rainfall, um, and so we want a really good response to the types of plants that we're planting up here. And Lucene is just a cornerstone to us, because for one millimetre of rain, well, we can get um, 24 kilograms of high quality dry matter, white clovers uh, next off the rank and down at, down at ryegrass. Uh, but um, we want to really have the types of feed within our systems that uh, do maximise the amount of dry matter that's grown. Uh, genetics, of course, are going to play a huge part in the evolution of sheep farming and beef farming and deer farming in New Zealand, uh, particularly if we lock on to um, breeders that are using breeding values and looking for the traits that we're looking for. Uh, and there's all sorts of, that's not dogs, that's actually meant to be dags. Uh, so we can breed out dags out of a, out of a sheep breed. Uh, if we're working with the right brand breeder that's focused on that sort of thing. Um, well, uh, I guess I'm referring to fine wool there, some of the attributes that farmers are looking for. But for crossbred farmers, wool now, of course, is just such a cost centre. And it's a real tragedy. It really is. And so the concept of woolless sheep is real. Uh, you know, I was looking at the stats, uh, I think... Um, $7 income, $12 for all the costs associated with sharing and crutching and all those sort of things. It's become a huge cost centre. But not only that, there's the labour, there's the fly strike, 
<clears throat> bags, everything else that's associated with it. Uh, and so the concept of walnut sheep is possibly an opportunity for some farmers in the crossbreed industry to consider in terms of dropping costs. Uh, so it's almost like this breeding new becomes a breeding cow in a way. Uh, and just, uh, you know, the, the, the cost of labour associated with sheep is huge. Uh, so decreasing costs through uh, genetics. The concept of lean, I think there was, um, Jana Hocken talked about that last week, uh, highest quality at the last uh, cost, and it's all about that efficiency. And looking at every activity and process on the farm, is there a better way to do it? And of course, that actually doesn't apply to just farming businesses. It applies to every single business. To stay competitive, we have to improve efficiency <clears throat> within all aspects of, the, of our business. Uh, and um, the best way of doing that, of course, is integrating the whole team within that exercise, making sure that everybody has got the opportunity to provide ideas because it's those incremental improvements in efficiency uh, that incrementally make a big, big difference over time. And it's having a culture of continuous improvement, that whole Kaizen principle, uh, and having the team openly uh, wanting to um, provide ideas to improve efficiency. Uh, and, and part of that is actually looking at every activity in detail. And I know that, that we have that culture uh, within our business. Of course, technology and innovation, um, and that's sort of linked to this, um, the concept of lean as well. But uh, there's so many opportunities now within agriculture where there's quite significant returns uh, in terms of making an extra investment. It seems kind of weird talking about, well, you know, we're trying to save cost, and here I am talking about investment. But maybe the way to think about investment is, if there are opportunities that can give us a 30 plus percent return on investment, they're probably worth looking at um, if we've got the access to capital. Uh, and, and there's all sorts of weird and wonderful opportunities uh, that uh, we've got available now, but there'll be a whole lot more going forward. And we just have to, have to keep an eye on those sorts of things going forward. And I guess that's all part of... Um, you know, spending a bit of time off farm, um, spending time with other farmers uh, and just getting some uh, exposure to those ideas. Kind of weird, uh, when I was trimming across Southland the other day with um, looking at beef cattle uh, grazing, um, you know, fodder beet uh, with, uh, and, that, and dairy cattle too, of course, with absolutely no electric fences there. Yeah, but certainly some beef farmers are now using uh, the collars on the cows, halter is it to um, shift the, the, the grazing cattle two or three times a day. Uh, and uh, it's better utilisation for the crop and it's faster growth rates for the cattle. So an interesting sort of concept. Pricing cost certainty, are there some inputs that can be contracted uh, and is there some income that can be contracted? And that that, um, that is really about providing some certainty, I guess. Uh, and when we talk inputs, it might be some animal health inputs, it might be might be contractors, um, some of those sorts of things. So what else have we got? I know that people in the past have talked about fertiliser and there's certainly efficient ways to use fertiliser and it comes down to doing some good soil testing and working out <coughs> what's required because there is quite good banks of fertility in a lot of uh, a lot of farmers' properties now. Uh, we've seen a rise in this concept of having multiple species within a pasture mix uh, providing some sort of benefit to livestock. But there's absolutely no science beyond probably three species to create more dry matter per hectare. There might be some other benefits in terms of some animal health benefits and those sort of things, but in terms of dry matter per hectare, anything beyond three to four species, there's absolutely no advantage. And so there could be a bit of an opportunity just to reduce the uh, seed costs there. Planning and buying in advance, and I just talked about that contracting one, but just have it, the importance of having plans going forward uh, that uh, things can be bought in bulk, uh, things can be uh, worked through in terms of pasture and cropping plans. And there's a, there's a whole lot of benefits in terms of efficiencies there as well, but um, that may be a bit of an opportunity. ACC, I do see 
a lot of um, double up in insurance in this area where some farmers have got um, their own individual cover um, in terms of income replacement, but they've also got ACC because they're getting a shareholder salary and those sort of things. So there's certainly the ability to nominate a minimum cover an ACC if you've already got income protection. Um, and there are other opportunities around the classification unit. For example, a farming partner could be on an administration code rather than being an active farmer. And then it's nearly um, $2 per $100 of wages to be saved on that one, just simply by being on the right uh, ACC code administration rather than being an active farmer. Insurance, I won't go into this in a lot of detail, but, you know, premiums have just absolutely skyrocketed. And it's because insurance companies, of course, have been losing money hand over fist over the last uh, four or five years on, on a worldwide basis. And we're subjected to all of those uh, events worldwide because we, as a country, are reinsured with worldwide insurance companies. And so um, all the events that have gone on all have an impact, not just in New Zealand. And so it's really important to think about insurance is that it's all about risk management and it's, it's ensuring the bigger risks. And maybe we can take a bit of risk back to our own balance sheet in terms of having higher um, excesses, some of those sort of things. I really do find in later... And, and farmers uh, later in their careers are often overinsured, um, and that can often be on a <clears throat> on a personal basis as well. Now I won't go into all of this, but it's really the concept of having higher excesses uh, for uh, farm um, buildings, equipment, all those sort of things. Higher excesses for health insurance, um, if uh, income protection is being used, having a stand down period. Um, trauma cover I find is, is overemphasized and oversold quite a lot and um, and sometimes there's too much life insurance uh, being used when it's actually not required at all uh, temporary life insurance so get a little bit of an independent view or talk to some mates about it I mean insurance agents at the end of the day are paid um, a commission on the amount of insurance uh, they're paid. So they're not completely independent uh, when they um, are selling insurance to you. Benchmarking. Benchmarking is, um, of course, a really good opportunity in any business, but um, in these sort of times, uh, it's really good to go through on a line-by-line -line basis and have uh, compare that with um, other farmers in your own farming class. And you can do that through the Beef and Lamb Economic Farm survey data, accounting farm surveys, other farm consultants, maybe even banks. So it's a really good exercise just to benchmark yourself as to uh, how your costs look with other farmers. Interest rate policy, <clears throat> have you got one? Um, what are the options around that? Um, and, you know, here's, here's a little example of an interest rate policy in terms of fixing uh, you know, a little bit of the debt over time. Now, it certainly won't be the lowest um, over in, in a single year, but it probably will spread uh, the uh, cost of interest out over a period of um, period of time. Um, of course, highly indebted farmers probably need to have a percentage uh, on different fixed rate terms in terms of the risk management. I think it's really worthwhile asking your banker, your financier, what your margin is, uh, what you can do to reduce it, and asking how all of that really, really works. Uh, if you're not getting the answers you want, then maybe maybe you need to talk to another bank because it should be something that's readily available that you can readily understand and understand how you can push that uh, margin down with the bank if you meet certain criteria. That's a really worthwhile conversation, I feel. So reducing costs, considerations. I've talked a lot about efficiency, reducing costs, higher production, <clears throat> uh, and engaging the whole team in terms of that, uh, coming up with um, ideas to lean the costs down. Uh, slowing down the pasture rotation, so some double, double cropping and those sort of things. Of course, you have to be very wary of um, any crop diseases that might be 
part of that rotation. Employee to contract the model. <clears throat> so some farmers have dropped their staff. And it's really unfortunate, of course, in rural areas because they're part of the community. But in the end, uh, it's a matter of making the numbers work. Um, and in some cases, they've actually been able to rent their house out um, as part of that whole, whole process. Consolidation mode is pretty obvious, stop the development. Um, postpone principal repayments, but get back on the bus as soon as you can. And whoops, some farmers have cashed up endowment life insurance policies just to provide a bit more working capital. Drawings is always a bit of a touchy subject. <clears throat> um, and for some some farmers, some businesses, it is a challenge and it, and it is an issue. Uh, our average is 72,000 cash and scale of 6,200 stock units. So $1,400 cash a week. And when I work out the numbers, if I multiply that to find out what a taxable income is related to those drawings, I typically uh, multiply that by 1.7 to include tax, accommodation, private power, vehicles, farm produce. I see taxes on that twice. Might be double tax. About 122,000. So 72,000 cash equals 122,000 taxable income is what would have to earn off the farm to have 72,000 cash come in because of um, all of those other costs uh, that are paid by the farm in terms of rates and interest on the house and those sort of things. Um, now, if, um, if we're looking at drawings, and, and for, as I said, for some businesses, some farmers, it, it is a consideration. Um, you know, some people will ask, how do we reduce the drawings? But I think the key there is to measure it. Uh, measuring drawings and putting drawings into a whole lot of boxes, just like we do with um, working expenses, you know, what's our cost of food, what's the cost of eating out, what's clothes, what's entertainment, uh, children, education, all those sorts of things, holidays. Um, then we can start to determine uh, where we're spending uh, the drawings money and, and maybe there are opportunities to look at that a little bit different. Um, Minimise expense on farm cards and uh, in some cases cut the credit card up or uh, certainly as a minimum clear it monthly. Uh, delaying payments that are in quite a tight spot. Uh, merchandise firms can provide some credit for a period for large companies, of course. Uh, tax payments. So there's a um, <clears throat> opportunity. You can do it through the IRD and have an arrangement there. Uh, so provisional taxes owing and there's not quite the ability to pay at this time of year. And I've certainly got a few dairy farmers in that, that boat with um, the milk check not coming in just at the moment. And so they're using Tax Management New Zealand, a finance rate of 9.9% .9 or a finance plan if they pay the interest up front of 8.23%. Uh, so they'll make a commitment, for example, to pay that in November when uh, the returns improve. So revising tax payments down, and this is certainly very real when the incomes do come off um, a previously high year. It's all based on a budget. Uh, there's the ability to produce a uh, reduce provisional tax payments, or in some cases, not make them at, at all. If you do underestimate provisional tax payments, you can pick it up through Tax Management New Zealand. You will avoid the penalties, and there, but there is this cost of 9.9%. But it can be an opportunity uh, just to say, actually, I think I don't need to pay that. If I get it wrong, I can... I can um, rectify the situation through Tax Management New Zealand and not get a penalty. Uh, so taxable income planning in lower profit years can, for some farmers and business owners, lead to family support and children's entitlement to university. Within farming, we have got a number of tax planning options, including deferring the um, claim of fertiliser. So in a really low income year, we don't have to claim fertiliser. We can push that forward. And therefore, we can get access to more uh, social payments over time in terms of family support and that sort of thing. I actually had a farmer a while ago, I think a year ago, um, he said that, no, he didn't want any access to family support, didn't think it was right, until I told him that there was 1.6 million beneficiaries in New Zealand. Uh, completely changed his uh, thinking pattern on that one.
Um, so that could be an opportunity. So sources of cash in really tight times. Cash or borrow against life insurance endowment policy, maybe sell off a little uh, lifestyle block, surplus machinery, uh, sell capital plant and lease. Yeah, well, that's, that's a bit of an extreme option, but certainly an option. Or even get finance on uh, one of your existing vehicles that's been paid off. ETS registration and sale of ETS units is certainly um, becoming more prevalent in Hill Country. It's a real source of income uh, and has made a substantial difference. And so that's native vegetation, uh, native trees that have got the potential to grow to five metres over time. Bit of a side hustle on farms, so tourism, wind farms. Really weird, I was out the other day and uh, the only things that we were looking at all day was tourism, wind farms and solar farming. Um, and ETS actually, uh, all in one day, all on sheep farms. Off-farm income uh, is a potential, and that amounts to a, a lot of our clients um, at around about 20000 a year. Asking help from the extended family, um, and sometimes a source of cash is finding a new bank can be a real option. Uh, financial planning and management, I'm just running... Only a bit tight for the time here, so I think this is the second last slide. Uh, what does best practice look like? Budgets, of course, with all the assumptions involved, and they can sometimes be two to three years out of this uh, development and that sort of thing. No surprise that communication is the, is the key. Um, uh, overdrafts community well in advance. Uh, regular updates um, can make a big difference. Uh, I've got a lot of clients sending regular updates to the banks on a voluntary basis, particularly when the cash flows are tight, uh, and just communicating about what's happening. They're, of course, looking for principal repayments over time. Uh, a banker uh, told me a while ago they just love to hear from their clients uh, every 90 days. And if they don't, they'll be ringing them themselves. So some sort of proactive uh, communication in tight financial times is a really worthwhile thing to do. The concept of working out a reverse budget, so it's actually a different way of doing a budget, and I and um, it was uh, well talked about at the Agri Women's Development uh, Trust working on your farming business. So, cash required uh, from the business drawings, principal tax in there as well, uh, capex interest, farm working expenses. What does the farm income need to be to meet all of those things, and therefore what sort of farming model is required to achieve it? Just a very, very different way uh, of doing a budget, maybe food for thought. It creates a bit of lateral thinking. Um, and just in summary, uh, having the right farm model is absolutely the key for long-term profitability. It trumps hard work every single day. Uh, and it can involve an investment of time um, and perhaps helping, uh, getting some help in to look at the, at the long-term uh, model, but uh, the right farm model makes a colossal difference. Measure and manage the core drivers, and they'll be different in every single business. Uh, benchmark them internally, so what's happening with your business over time and what's happening externally in terms of the beef and lamb uh, farm surveys, farm discussion groups and that. Small incremental improvements, we talked about that, the case in principle makes a big difference. Uh, benchmarking and monitoring, and that's where we can find a lot of opportunity within our business if we are doing this monitoring on a regular basis, uh, makes a big, big, big difference um, to be able to lift that income incrementally over time as uh, we find opportunities for improved production. Managing the bank balance, uh, reviewing it regularly, um, the, and when we're dealing with the bank in terms of budgeting, delaying income, advancing expenditure, being realistic, if it doesn't work, and rework the plan, <clears throat> working out what's a need versus a want, which should be a really good topic for a lot of councils at the moment. Needs versus wants. Actively manage the banking relationship. Uh, use options to avoid going over the bank limit. Uh, maintaining fertilizer over the medium term, communicating and involving the family. Bank, trusted team and close friends. As we talked about, the down cycles tend to be a lot shorter than the, than the um, up cycles. So often it's uh, best to dig in deep and hang in there, but always, always look for the options. Uh, levers can be pulled. 
uh, to delay cash uh, in the medium to long term, but we still need that robust business model. And we just can't underestimate what really good production does in terms of lowering that cost. And get help of managing finance is not your strength. Um, and that might be helping with some of the processes and systems. That might be help, help in terms of um, you know, working through those longer term models, those sorts of things. So, uh, Nick, I think that um, sums up my presentation. I've gone slightly over time there, but I'll hand it back to you. No, that's perfect. Thank you so much for that, George. Um, that was a really useful presentation and um, loaded with lots of ideas for our listeners. Um, I've already had some questions about whether we can provide this afterwards. So um, we are recording tonight's session and we'll make it available on our Facebook page, which I've just put a link to um, in the chat box. Um, so you can view it again later. I think, yeah, there's a lot of take homes in that, George, um, some really useful stuff. But I think um, one of the important things was around just putting in perspective where we are currently compared with where we've been in the past. You know, there there is a cycle. Um, things are starting to turn. And we'll look a little bit further into this next week around um, what the opportunities might be for the red meat sector going forward. So I think that's a really important one to um to take away and again that um, having the right business model and really just um, trying to get as much out of your accountant and other advisors as you can because there's a wealth of knowledge out there and some really useful tips um, that can save a lot of money um, and or highlight some opportunities that perhaps you hadn't thought of so yeah that was really useful thank you very much George. Um, I've got a couple of questions here in the chat box so um, one is around fertiliser and just your opinion on is it better to keep applying basic levels of fertiliser in tough years in order to maintain production in future years versus not applying in tough times and playing catch up in the years to come coupled with lower production um, of dry matter, et cetera. Mm. Um, and then potentially running cash deficits in order to maintain high levels of production in years to come. Yeah. Um, well, going, going back to first principles, you know, I, the cheapest form of feed that can be grown is pasture. Um, what drives a pastoral system is the legumes, <clears throat> the clover. Uh, and uh, what's required for clover typically is, um, is sulfur, sometimes potassium. But in, in a lot of farming systems, it could be that there's a lower rate of um, in, in really tight years, it could be a lower rate of phosphate applied. Uh, but I think in a lot of cases, it's really important to keep up the sulphur, uh, to keep the legumes ticking over that produces the nitrogen for uh, the, the grasses. Um, in terms of um, a really tight year, it's a matter of um, whether there's the ability, uh, you know, having the um, permission, I guess, or the conversations with the bank is that we are running at a deficit, but we want to protect our production going forward. If, um, if quite a lot of uh, the fertiliser that's been used in terms of sulphur is elemental sulphur, then of course there is the opportunity to um, perhaps delay a, a year of its elemental sulphur because some of that ticks into the next year. Um, but if, um, there's two or three years of delay with the pastoral system that will have a material impact uh, on the production um, in terms of not only the pasture growing but the quality of feed growing because we know that uh, livestock do really well uh, on legumes, um, particularly young stock. Uh, so yeah, if we can keep up our fertiliser, uh, even if it's at lower rates and even if it's trimming up some of that phosphate, certainly the um, the sulphur component, I think, is is really, really important. Yeah, it's a big one, and naturally that's where you're looking, um, um, you know, when you're looking, reviewing your expenses, that's certainly the one that farmers tend to look at first. Um, what, what I'll do, we ran a really good session last year um, with Dr Robert McBride, 
and Dr. Ernst Roberts on this very topic. So I'm going to post that on our Facebook page. I've put the link to our Facebook page in the chat box. So I'll do that just after the webinar and um, anyone who's interested can go back and have a look and, at that in a wee bit more detail. Um, I'm just checking again. I think that's all um, for questions. So I'm going to wrap up the session. A big thank you, George, for um, giving up your evening to talk to us tonight. That was a um, really valuable session and very much appreciate um, your time. And I think that's given people a lot of useful ideas to go home and think about and apply to their business, hopefully. Uh, big thank you to everyone for joining us today. I hope you found the insights and strategies that George discussed useful. And um, next week, we're going to have a session with, and this is kind of wrapping up our three-part webinar series um, on a high, if you like, <laughs> focusing on the opportunities for the red meat sector going forward. We've got Dr. Jacqueline Roth um, from Lincoln University is going to be speaking at that and uh, Jen Corcoran from Rabobank. So they've got some, some good messages for us to focus on heading into the next season. So I hope you all join us for that next week. Um, you should receive a registration link in your email inbox next Monday. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.